This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Chapter 43. Esther's Narrative. It matters little now how much I thought of my living mother, who had told me evermore to consider her dead. I could not venture to approach her or to communicate with her in writing, for my sense of the peril in which her life was passed was only to be equalled by my fears of increasing it. Knowing that my mere existence as a living creature was an unforeseen danger in her way, I could not always conquer the terror of myself which had seized me when I first knew the secret. At no time did I dare to utter her name. I felt as if I did not even dare to hear it. If the conversation anywhere, when I was present, took that direction, as it sometimes naturally did, I tried not to hear. I mentally counted, repeated something that I knew, or went out of the room. I am conscious now that I often did these things when there can have been no danger of her being spoken of, but I did them in the dread I had of hearing anything that might lead to her betrayal, and to her betrayal, through me. It matters little now how often I recalled the tones of my mother's voice, wondered whether I should ever hear it again, as I so longed to do, and thought how strange and desolate it was that it should be so new to me. It matters little that I watched for every public mention of my mother's name, that I passed and repassed the door of her house in town, loving it, but afraid to look at it, that I once sat in the theatre when my mother was there and saw me, and when we were so wide asunder, before the great company of all degrees, that any link or confidence between us seemed a dream. It is all, all over. My lot has been so blessed that I can relate little of myself, which is not a story of goodness and generosity in others. I may well pass that little and go on. When we were settled at home again, Ada and I had many conversations with my guardian, of which Richard was the theme. My dear girl was deeply grieved that he should do their kind cousin so much wrong but she was so faithful to Richard that she could not bear to blame him, even for that. My guardian was assured of it, and never coupled his name with a word of reproof. "'Rick is mistaken, my dear,' he would say to her. "'Well, well, we have all been mistaken over and over again. We must trust to you and time to set him right.' We knew afterwards what we suspected then that he did not trust to time until he had often tried to open Richard's eyes. That he had written to him, gone to him, talked with him, tried every gentle and persuasive art his kindness could devise. Our poor devoted Richard was deaf and blind to all. If he were wrong, he would make amends when the chancery suit was over. If he were groping in the dark, he could not do better then do his utmost to clear away those clouds in which so much was confused and obscured. Suspicion and misunderstanding were the fault of the suit? Then let him work the suit out and come through it to his right mind. This was his unvarying reply. Jaundice and jaundice had obtained such possession of his whole nature that it was impossible to place any consideration before him which he did not, with a distorted kind of reason, make a new argument in favour of his doing what he did. So that it is even more mischievous, said my guardian once to me, to remonstrate with the poor dear fellow than to leave him alone. I took one of these opportunities of mentioning my doubts of Mr. Skimpole as a good adviser for Richard. Adviser? 
returned my guardian, laughing. My dear, who would advise with Skimpole? Encourager would perhaps have been a better word, said I. Encourager, returned my guardian again. Who could be encouraged by Skimpole? Not Richard, I asked. No, he replied, such an unworldly, uncalculating, gossamer creature is a relief to him and an amusement. But as to advising or encouraging or occupying a serious station toward anybody or anything, it is simply not to be thought of in such a child as Skimpole. Pray, Cousin John, said Ada, who had just joined us and now looked over my shoulder, what made him such a child? What made him such a child? inquired my guardian, rubbing his head a little, a little at a loss. Yes, cousin John. Why, he slowly replied, roughening his head more and more, he is all sentiment and, and susceptibility and, and sensibility and, and imagination and these qualities are not regulated in him, somehow. I suppose the people who admired him for them in his youth attached too much importance to them, and too little to any training that would have balanced and adjusted them. And so he became what he is. Hey, said my guardian, stopping short and looking at us hopefully, what do you think, you two? Ada, glancing at me, said she thought it was a pity he should be an expense to Richard. So it is, so it is, returned my guardian hurriedly. That must not be. We must arrange that. I must prevent it. That will never do. And I said I thought it was to be regretted that he had ever introduced Richard to Mr. Voles for a present of five pounds. Did he? said my guardian, with a passing shade of vexation on his face. But there you have the man, there you have the man. There is nothing mercenary in that with him. He has no idea of the value of money. He introduces Rick, and then he is good friends with Mr. Voles, and borrows five pounds of him. He means nothing by it, and thinks nothing of it. He told you himself. I'll be bound, my dear. Oh, yes, said I. Exactly, cried my guardian, quite triumphant. There you have the man. If he had meant any harm by it, or was conscious of any harm in it, he wouldn't tell it. He tells it as he does it, in mere simplicity. But you shall see him in his own home, and then you'll understand him better. We must pay a visit to Harold Skimpole, and caution him on these points. Lord bless you, my dears. An infant, an infant. In pursuance of this plan, we went into London on an early day, and presented ourselves at Mr. Skimpole's door. He lived in a place called the Polygon, in Somers Town, where there were at that time a number of poor Spanish refugees walking about in cloaks, smoking little paper cigars. Whether he was a better tenant than one might have supposed in consequence of his friend somebody always paying his rent at last, or whether his inaptitude for business rendered it particularly difficult to turn him out, I don't know. But he had occupied the same house some years. It was in a state of dilapidation quite equal to our expectation. Two or three of the area railings were gone, the water-butt was broken, the knocker was loose, the bell-handle had been pulled off a long time, to judge from the rusty state of the wire, and dirty footprints on the steps were the only signs of it being inhabited. A slatternly, full-blown girl, who seemed to be bursting out at the rents in her gown and the cracks in her shoes, like an overripe berry, answered our knock by opening the door a very little way, and stopping up the gap with her figure. As she knew Mr. Jarndyce, indeed Ada and I both thought that she evidently associated him with the receipt of her wages, she immediately relented and allowed us to pass in. 
the lock of the door being in a disabled condition she then applied herself to securing it with the chain which was not in good action either and said would we go upstairs we went upstairs to the first floor still seeing no other furniture than the dirty footprints mr jarndyce without further ceremony entered a room there and we followed it was dingy enough and not at all clean but furnished with an odd kind of shabby luxury with a large footstool a sofa and plenty of cushions an easy chair and plenty of pillows a piano books drawing materials music newspapers and a few sketches and pictures a broken pane of glass in one of the dirty windows was papered and wafered over but there was a little plate of hothouse nectarines on the table and there was another of grapes and another of sponge cakes and there was a bottle of light wine mr skimpole himself reclined upon the sofa in a dressing-gown drinking some fragrant coffee from an old china cup it was then about midday and looking at a collection of wallflowers in the balcony he was not in the least disconcerted by our appearance but rose and received us in his usual airy manner here i am you see he said when we were seated not without some little difficulty the greater part of the chairs being broken here i am this is my frugal breakfast some men want legs of beef and mutton for breakfast i don't give me my peach my cup of coffee and my claret i am content i don't want them for themselves but they remind me of the sun there's nothing solar about legs of beef and mutton mere animal satisfaction this is our friend's consulting room or would be if he ever prescribed his sanctum his studio said my guardian to us yes said mr skimpole turning his bright face about this is the bird's cage this is where the bird lives and sings they pluck his feathers now and then and clip his wings but he sings he sings he handed us the grapes repeating in his radiant way he sings not an ambitious note but still he sings these are very fine said my guardian a present no he answered no some amiable gardener sells them his man wanted to know when he brought them last evening whether he should wait for the money really my friend i said i think not if your time is of any value to you i suppose it was for he went away my guardian looked at us with a smile as though he asked us is it possible to be worldly with this baby this is a day said mr skimpole gaily taking a little claret in a tumbler that will ever be remembered here we shall call it st clair and st summerson day you must see my daughters i have a blue-eyed daughter who is my beauty daughter i have a sentiment daughter and i have a comedy daughter you must see them all they'll be enchanted he was going to summon them when my guardian interposed and asked him to pause a moment as he wished to say a word to him first my dear jarndyce he cheerfully replied going back to his sofa as many moments as you please time is no object here we never know what o'clock it is and we never care not the way to get on in life you'll tell me certainly but we don't get on in life we don't pretend to do it my guardian looked at us again plainly saying you hear him now harold he began the word i have to say relates to rick the dearest friend i have returned mr skimpole cordially i suppose he ought not to be my dearest friend as he is not on terms with you but he is i can't help it he is full of youthful poetry and i love him if you don't like it i can't help it i love him the engaging frankness with which he made this declaration really had a disinterested appearance and captivated my guardian if not for the moment ada too you are welcome to love him as much as you like returned mr jarndyce but we must save his pocket harold oh said mr skimpole his pocket now you are coming to what i don't understand taking a little more claret and dipping one of the cakes in it he
he shook his head and smiled at ada and me with an ingenious foreboding that he never could be made to understand if you go with him here or there said my guardian plainly you must not let him pay for both my dear jarndyce returned mr skimpole his genial face irradiated by the comicality of this idea what am i to do if he takes me anywhere i must go and how can i pay i never have any money if i had any money i don't know anything about it suppose i say to a man how much suppose the man says to me seven and sixpence i know nothing about seven and sixpence it is impossible for me to pursue the subject with any consideration for the man i don't go about asking busy people what seven and sixpence is in moorish which i don't understand why should i go about asking them what seven and sixpence is in money which i don't understand well said my guardian by no means displeased with this artless reply if you come to any kind of journeying with rick you must borrow the money of me never breathing the least allusion to that circumstance and leave the calculation to him my dear jarndyce returned mr skimpole i will do anything to give you pleasure but it seems an idle form a superstition besides i give you my word miss clare and my dear miss summerson i thought mr carstone was immensely rich i thought he had only to make over something or to sign a bond or a draft or a cheque or a bill or to put something on a file somewhere to bring down a shower of money indeed it is not so sir said ada he is poor no really returned mr skimpole with his bright smile you surprise me and not being the richer for trusting in a rotten reed said my guardian laying his hand emphatically on the sleeve of mr skimpole's dressing-gown be very careful not to encourage him in that reliance harold my good dear friend returned mr skimpole and my dear miss summerson and my dear miss clare how can i do that it's a business and i don't know business it is he who encourages me he emerges from great feats of business presents the brightest prospects before me as their results and calls upon me to admire them i do admire them as bright prospects but i know no more about them and i tell him so the helpless kind of candour with which he presented this before us the light-hearted manner in which he was amused by his innocence the fantastic way in which he took himself under his own protection and argued about that curious person combined with the delightful ease of everything he said exactly to make out my guardian's case the more i saw of him the more unlikely it, it seemed to me when he was present that he could design conceal or influence anything and yet the less likely that appeared when he was not present and the less agreeable it was to think of his having anything to do with any one for whom i cared hearing that his examination as he called it was now over mr skimpole left the room with a radiant face to fetch his daughters his sons had run away at various times leaving my guardian quite delighted by the manner in which he had vindicated his childish character he soon came back bringing with him the three young ladies and mrs skimpole who had once been a beauty but was now a delicate high-nosed invalid suffering under a complication of disorders this said mr skimpole is my beauty daughter arethusa plays and sings odds and ends like her father this is my sentiment daughter laura plays a little but don't sing this is my comedy daughter kitty sings a little but don't play we all draw a little and compose a little and none of us have any idea of time or money mrs skimpole sighed i thought as if she would have been glad to strike out this item in the family attainments i also thought that she rather impressed her sigh upon my guardian and that she took every opportunity of throwing in another it is pleasant said mr skimpole turning his sprightly eyes from one to the other of us and it is whimsically interesting to trace peculiarities in families 
in this family we are all children and i am the youngest the daughters who appeared to be very fond of him were amused by this droll fact particularly the comedy daughter my dears it is true said mr skimpole is it not so it is and so it must be because like the dogs in the hymn it is our nature to now here is miss summerson with a fine administrative capacity and a knowledge of details perfectly surprising it will sound very strange in miss summerson's ears i dare say that we know nothing about chops in this house but we don't not the least we can't cook anything whatever a needle and thread we don't know how to use we admire the people who possess the practical wisdom we want but we don't quarrel with them then why should they quarrel with us live and let live we say to them live upon your practical wisdom and let us live upon you he laughed but as usual seemed quite candid and really to mean what he said we have sympathy my roses said mr skimpole sympathy for everything have we not oh yes papa cried the three daughters in fact that is our family department said mr skimpole in this hurly-burly of life we are capable of looking on and of being interested and we do look on and we are interested what more can we do here is my beauty daughter married these three years now i dare say her marrying another child and having two more was all wrong in point of political economy but it was very agreeable we had our little festivities on those occasions and ex exchanged social ideas she brought her young husband home one day and they and their young fledglings have their nest upstairs i dare say at some time or other sentiment and comedy will bring their husbands home and have their nests upstairs too so we get on we don't know how but somehow she looked very young indeed to be the mother of two children and i could not help pitying both her and them it was evident that the three daughters had grown up as they could and had had just as little haphazard instruction as qualified them to be their father's playthings in his idlest hours his pictorial tastes were consulted i observed in their respective styles of wearing their hair the beauty daughter being in the classic manner the sentiment daughter luxuriant and flowing and the comedy daughter in the arch style with a good deal of sprightly forehead and vivacious little curls dotted about the corners of her eyes they were dressed to correspond though in a most untidy and negligent way ada and i conversed with these young ladies and found them wonderfully like their father in the meantime mr jarndyce who had been rubbing his head to a great extent and hinted at a change in the wind talked with mrs skimpole in a corner where we could not help hearing the chink of money mr skimpole had previously volunteered to go home with us and had withdrawn to dress himself for the purpose my roses he said when he came back take care of mamma she is poorly to-day by going home with mr jarndyce for a day or two i shall hear the lock sing and preserve my amiability it has been tried you know and would be tried again if i remained at home that bad man said the comedy daughter at the very time when he knew papa was lying ill by his wallflowers looking at the blue sky laura complained and when the smell of hay was in the air said arethusa it showed a want of poetry in the man mr skimpole assented but with perfect good humour it was coarse there was an absence of the finer touches of humanity in it my daughters have taken great offence he explained to us at an honest man not honest papa impossible they all three protested at a rough kind of fellow a sort of human hedgehog rolled up said mr skimpole who is a baker in this neighbourhood and from whom we borrowed a couple of armchairs we wanted a couple of armchairs and we hadn't got them and therefore of course we looked to a man who had got them to lend them 
well this morose person lent them and we wore them out when they were worn out he wanted them back he had them back he was contented you will say not at all he objected to their being worn i reasoned with him and pointed out his mistake i said can you at your time of life be so headstrong my friend as to persist that an armchair is a thing to put upon a shelf and look at that it is an object to contemplate to survey from a distance to consider from a point of sight don't you know that these armchairs were borrowed to be sat upon he was unreasonable and unpersuadable and used intemperate language being as patient as i am at this minute i addressed another appeal to him i said now my good man however our business capacities may vary we are all children of one great mother nature on this blooming summer morning here you see me i was on the sofa with flowers before me fruit upon the table the cloudless sky above me the air full of fragrance contemplating nature i entreat you by our common brotherhood not to interpose between me and a subject so sublime the absurd figure of an angry baker but he did said mr skimpole raising his laughing eyes in playful astonishment he did interpose that ridiculous figure and he does and he will again and therefore i am very glad to get out of his way and go home with my friend jarndyce it seemed to escape his consideration that mrs skimpole and the daughters remained behind to encounter the baker but this was so old a story to all of them that it be it had become a matter of course he took leave of his family with a tenderness as airy and graceful as any other aspect in which he showed himself and rode away with us in perfect harmony of mind we had an opportunity of seeing through some open doors as we went downstairs that his own apartment was a palace to the rest of the house i could have no anticipation and i had none that something very startling to me at the moment and every ever memorable to me in what ensued from it was to happen before this day was out our guest was in such spirits on the way home that i could do nothing but listen to him and wonder at him nor was i alone in this for ada yielded to the same fascination as to my guardian the wind which had threatened to become fixed in the east when we left somers town veered completely round before we were a couple of miles from it whether of questionable childishness or not in any other matters mr skimpole had a child's enjoyment of change and bright weather in no way wearied by his sallies on the road he was in the drawing-room before any of us and i heard him at the piano while i was yet looking after my housekeeping singing refrains of barcarolles and singing songs italian and german by the score we were all assembled shortly before dinner and he was still at the piano idly picking out in his luxurious way little strains of music and talking between whiles of finishing some sketches of the ruined old verulam wall to-morrow which he had begun a year or two ago and had got tired of when a card was brought in and my guardian read aloud in a surprised voice sir lester dedlock the visitor was in the room while it was yet turning round with me and before i had the power to stir if i had had it i should have hurried away i had not even the presence of mind in my giddiness to retire to ada in the window or to see the window or to know where it was i heard my name and found that my guardian was presenting me before i could move to a chair pray be seated sir lester mr jarndyce said sir lester in reply as he bowed and seated himself i do myself the honour of calling here you do me the honour sir lester thank you of calling here on my road from lincolnshire to express my regret that any cause of complaint however strong that i may have against a gentleman who who is known to you and has been your host and to whom therefore i will make no further reference 
should have prevented you, still more ladies under your escort and charge, from seeing whatever little there may be to gratify a polite and refined taste at my house, Chesney Wold. You are exceedingly obliging, Sir Lester, and on behalf of those ladies who are present, and for myself I thank you very much. It is possible, Mr. Jarndyce, that the gentleman to whom, for the reasons I have mentioned, I refrain from making further allusion, it is possible, Mr. Jarndyce, that the gentleman may have done me the honour so far to misapprehend my character as to induce you to believe that you would not have been received by my local establishment in Lincolnshire with that urbanity, that courtesy, which its members are instructed to show to all ladies and gentlemen who present themselves at that house. I merely beg to observe, sir, that the fact is the reverse. My guardian delicately dismissed this remark without making any verbal answer. It has given me pain, Mr. Jarndyce, Sir Lester weightily proceeded. I assure you, sir, it has given me pain to learn from the housekeeper at Chesney Wold that a gentleman who was in your company in that part of the county and who would appear to possess a cultivated taste for fine arts was likewise deterred by some such cause from examining the family pictures with that leisure, that attention, that care which he might have desired to bestow upon them, and which some of them might possibly have repaid. Here he produced a card and read, with much gravity and a little trouble, through his eyeglass, Mr. Harold, 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 Scampling, Scumpling, I beg your pardon, Skimpole. This is Mr. Harold Skimpole, said my guardian, evidently surprised. Oh, exclaimed Sir Lester, I am happy to meet Mr. Skimpole, and to have the opportunity of tendering my personal regrets. I hope, sir, that when you again find yourself in any part of the county, you will be under no similar sense of restraint. You are very obliging, Sir Lester Dedlock. So encouraged, I shall certainly give myself the pleasure and advantage of another visit to your beautiful house. The owners of such places as Chesney Wold, said Mr. Skimpole, with his usual happy and easy air, are public benefactors. They are good enough to maintain a number of delightful objects for the admiration and pleasure of us poor men, and not to reap all the admiration and pleasure that they yield is to be ungrateful to our benefactors. Sir Lester seemed to approve of this sentiment highly. An artist, sir? No, returned Mr. Skimpole, a perfectly idle man, a mere amateur. Sir Lester seemed to approve of this even more. He hoped he might have the good fortune to be at Chesney Wold when Mr. Skimpole next came down into Lincolnshire. Mr. Skimpole professed himself much flattered and honoured. Mr. Skimpole mentioned, pursued Sir Lester, addressing himself again to my guardian, mentioned to the housekeeper, who, as he may have observed, is an old and attached retainer of the family. That is, when I walked through the house the other day, on the occasion of my going down to visit Miss Summerson and Miss Clare, Mr. Skimpole airily explained to us, that the friend with whom he had formerly been staying there was Mr. Jarndyce. Sir Lester bowed to the bearer of that name, and hence I became aware of the circumstance for which I have professed my regret, that this should have occurred to any gentleman, Mr. Jarndyce, but especially a gentleman formerly known to Lady Dedlock, and indeed claiming some distant connection with her, and for whom, as I learn from my lady here, she entertains a high respect, does, I assure you, give me pain. Pray say no more about it, Sir Lester, returned my guardian. I am very sensible, as I am sure we all are, of your consideration. Indeed, the mistake was mine, and I ought to apologize for it. I had not once looked up, I had not seen the visitor, 
and had not even appeared to myself to hear the conversation. It surprises me to find that I can recall it, for it seemed to make no impression on me as it passed. I heard them speaking, but my mind was so confused, and my instinctive avoidance of this gentleman made his presence so distressing to me, that I thought I understood nothing, through the rushing in my head and the beating of my heart. "'I mentioned the subject to Lady Dedlock,' said Sir Lester, rising, "'and my lady informed me that she had had the pleasure of exchanging a few words with Mr. Jarndyce and his wards on the occasion of an accidental meeting during their sojourn in the vicinity. Permit me, Mr. Jarndyce, to repeat to yourself and to these ladies the assurance I have already tendered to Mr. Skimpole. Circumstances undoubtedly prevent my saying that it would afford me any gratification to hear that Mr. Boythorn had favoured my house with his presence, but those circumstances are confined to that gentleman himself, and do not extend beyond him. "'You know my old opinion of him,' said Mr. Skimpole, lightly appealing to us, "'an amiable bull who is determined to make every colour scarlet.' Sir Lester Dedlock coughed, as if he could not possibly hear another word in reference to such an individual, and took his leave with great ceremony and politeness. I got to my own room with all possible speed, and remained there until I had recovered my self-command. It had been very much disturbed, but I was thankful to find, when I went downstairs again, that they only rallied me for having been shy and mute before the great Lincolnshire baronet. By that time I had made up my mind that the period was come when I must tell my guardian what I knew. The possibility of my being brought into contact with my mother, of my being taken to her house, even of Mr. Skimpole's, however distantly associated with me, receiving kindnesses and obligations from her husband, was so painful that I felt I could no longer guide myself without his assistance. When we had retired for the night, and Ada and I had had our usual talk in our pretty room, I went out at my door again and sought my guardian among his books. I knew he always read at that hour, and as I drew near I saw the light shining out into the passage from his reading lamp. "'May I come in, guardian?' "'Surely, little woman, what's the matter?' "'Nothing is the matter. I thought I would like to take this quiet time of saying a word to you about myself.' He put a chair for me, shut his book, and put it by and turned his kind attentive face towards me. I could not help observing that it wore that curious expression I had observed in it once before, on that night when he had said that he was in no trouble which I could readily understand. "'What concerns you, my dear Esther,' said he, "'concerns us all. You cannot be more ready to speak than I am to hear.' "'I know that, guardian.' but I have such need of your advice and support. Oh, you don't know how much need I have to-night. He looked unprepared for my being so earnest, and even a little alarmed. Or how anxious I have been to speak to you, said I, ever since the visitor was here to-day. The visitor, my dear? Sir Lester Dedlock? Yes. He folded his arms and sat looking at me with an air of the profoundest astonishment, awaiting what I should say next. I did not know how to prepare him. "'Why, Esther,' said he, breaking into a smile, "'our visitor and you are the two last persons on earth I should have thought of connecting together.' "'Oh, yes, guardian, I know it. And I, too, but a little while ago.' The smile passed from his face, and he became graver than before. He crossed to the door to see that it was shut, but I had seen to that, and resumed his seat before me. "'Guardian,' said I, "'do you remember when we were overtaken by the thunderstorm, Lady Dedlock speaking to you of her sister?' "'Of course, of course I do.' "'And reminding you that she and her sister had differed, had gone their several ways?' 
Of course. Why did they separate, guardian? His face quite altered as he looked at me. My child, what questions are these? I never knew. No one but themselves ever did know, I believe. Who could tell what the secrets of those two handsome and proud women were? You have seen Lady Dedlock. If you had ever seen her sister, you would know her to have been as resolute and haughty as she. O oh, guardian, I have seen her many and many a time. Seen her? He paused a little, biting his lip. Then, Esther, when you spoke to me long ago of Boythorn, and when I told you that he was all but married once, and that the lady did not die, but died to him, and that the time had had its influence on his later life, did you know it all, and know who the lady was? No, guardian, I returned, fearful of the light that dimly broke upon me. Nor do I know yet. Lady Dedlock's sister. And why, I could scarcely ask him, why, guardian, pray tell me, why were they parted? It was her act, and she kept its motives in her inflexible heart. He afterwards did conjecture, but it was mere conjecture, that some injury which her haughty spirit had received in her cause of quarrel with her sister had wounded her beyond all reason, but she wrote him that from that date of that letter she died to him, as in literal truth she did, and that the resolution was exacted from her by her knowledge of his proud temper and his strained sense of honour, which were both her nature too. In consideration for those master points in him, and even in consideration for them in herself, she made the sacrifice, she said, and would live in it and die in it. She did both, I fear. Certainly he never saw her, never heard of her from that hour, nor did any one. O oh, guardian, what have I done? I cried, giving way to my grief. What sorrow have I innocently caused? You caused, Esther? Yes, guardian, innocently, but most surely, that secluded sister is my first remembrance. No, no, he cried, starting. Yes, guardian, yes, and her sister is my mother. I would have told him all my mother's letter, but he would not hear it then. He spoke so tenderly and wisely to me, and he put so plainly before me all I had myself imperfectly thought and hoped in my better state of mind, that, penetrated as I had been with fervent gratitude toward him through so many years, I believed I had never loved him so dearly, never thanked him in my heart so fully as I did that night. And when he had taken me to my room and kissed me at the door, and when at last I lay down to sleep, my thought was how could I ever be busy enough, how could I ever be good enough, how in my little way could I ever hope to be forgetful enough of myself, devoted enough to him, and useful enough to others, to show him how I blessed and honoured him. End of chapter 43